Well, thank you all very much. Thank you. Um, very nice to see so many of you here again. Um, it wasn't me that decided to give two talks at this uh, um, uh, at this wonderful conference. Um, it was the organisers, or actually perhaps it was a mistake. Perhaps it was a historically bad idea <laughs> that I should do so. Um, I thought I was going to um, just participate in a panel in which all the panellists would confess to having made historically bad mistakes. Um, but I thought perhaps I would start by finding out whether there's any agreement or disagreement with the overall thesis that null references have been a historically bad idea. Um, how, how many people here would agree with the statement that null references have been a historically bad idea? Great. And how, how many people would be against, would vote against that motion? Oh, I see. Well, I can see that the panel discussion will be a little bit one-sided. Um, so, would either of you be prepared to come up here later on in the afternoon and present your view that null references were a good idea? Or at least not too bad? Will you do? Thank you very much. Would anybody uh, care to be a representative for the people who thought they were bad idea? You said you would. Great. Well, I hope um, I will uh, dry uh, my uh, stream of words will dry up sometime in the near future, and I'll call on you to make good my deficiencies. How about another vote? Um, if uh, I am really responsible for null references, and uh, if I am, then it goes back to somewhere around 1964. Um, in all that time, uh, 40 years or so, how much do you think that uh, null reference violations have cost uh, in terms of uh, programmer um, time, uh, user discomfort, um, and general damage? Uh, do you think it was um, uh, less than or more than a billion dollars? Billion dollars in 40 years, well. Um, how many people would vote for more than a billion dollars? American billion, American billion, I think, yes. More, more please. More, more people for more. No? Right, good, a good half. And who think would think it would have cost less than that amount? And most people are in my, uh, agree with me that they don't know. However, um, let's just say of the order of a billion dollars, probably more than a tenth of a billion, probably less than um, uh, 10 billion. Um, so while, while my two substitute speakers are thinking what they're going to say, I'm going to, I hope, entertain you with a little bit of history of how I came to make this a rather bad idea. Um, my first job I took on as a programmer in 1960 with a small British computer manufacturer called Elliott's. And after I'd been there about nine months, I'd learned enough about programming, so that they asked me to design a uh, new programming language for them. Um, and very fortunately, I happened to find in the library uh, people used to have libraries in those days. Um, a little um, grey bound document of 23 pages, uh, typescript, my mimeographed, called um, Report on the International Algorithmic Language, Algol 60, edited by Peter Nauer. And I read that and was quite uh, attracted by it and took all the ideas for my new language from that document but I left out all the complicated things like ifs and thens, which I thought um, that our um, customers would never understand. Um, but fortunately, again, um, a little later, I came to understand them myself and suggested to my company that we should uh, implement that language rather than a language I'd invented myself. Well, at that time, um, 
And most people were programming still in machine code, and indeed um, all our uh, manufacturer's software was written in machine code, including the Algol compiler. Um, and the great thing about machine codes in those days is that you could understand them, and if you made a mistake, uh, you could follow through and find out um, what the uh, results of your mistake have been, and so diagnose what the mistake was. But if you were using a high-level language, that capacity was taken away from you because um, you no longer regarded the store as uh, consisting of, um, of 4,096 locations, um, each of which, of course, were, well, um, four and nine, um, four and seven eighths bytes long, uh, in the case of Elliot's, or in the case of other manufacturers, of course, like IBM, they couldn't afford 39 bits in each word, so they only had 36 bits. But we wanted to protect our customer from knowing the details of the machine architecture. So um, I took it as a general principle that if anything went wrong with the code, with the code that you'd written, if you made a mistake in your program, the results of your mistake would be predictable by looking at the high-level text of your program alone. And you never had to delve into um, what they used to call um, hexadecimal core dumps in order to find out what had gone wrong and try and find out what caused it. And that was a principle of the uh, design of the implementation. It had one... Um, a uh, quite expensive consequence that whenever the program contained a reference to an array um, with a subscript, the implementation had to insert a check that the subscript was within the subscript bounds. In Algol 60, the subscript bounds were uh, declarable by the program, both the lower bound and the upper bound. So for every subscript, um, there was a two checks made that it was uh, within its bounds and indeed in a, in a, um, uh, a two-dimensional array or a three-dimensional array there would be a separate check made for each subscript. And this really added quite a lot to the size of the code and to the time it took. Uh, on the uh, machine that I started programming on uh, we could manage uh, just about um, well, it was less than two kilo operations per second, um, 500 microseconds per um, operation, and a test was two operations, of course. Um, and it added uh, two or three um, instructions to the length of the code, uh, which was quite critical when you only have uh, 4,000 words of uh, uh, four and a bit bytes each. Um, but our customers um, accepted this and um, they didn't know any better because they weren't given any, given any option uh, not to accept it. Um, and as a result they never had an undetected um, subscript error. Um, was that a good historically good idea? Um, well, I think so, yes. In fact, it's, it's, uh, the, the, um, uh, uh, the world has discovered and is rapidly moving to a language in which the same policy was undertaken and every subscript is checked against uh, the array bounds um, on every access. Um, the language Java has, after a, a gap of um, over 30 years, has... Uh, reproduced the decision that I took in 1960. Um, well, I was, um, became very interested in a project for extension of Algol 60. I joined a committee which was, uh, whose uh, task it was to design a successor to Algol 60, and I very much enjoyed making suggestions, contributions, as I called it, to the design of the successor. 
R2 algol 60. And one of the um, suggestions that I made, I called record handling, and essentially it brought the concept of an object into the language, an object to which reference could be made uh, through a pointer. Now, of course, I knew from uh, long and bitter experience with machine code that when you were using pointers and indirect addressing, you could wreak the uh, um, ultimate havoc on the program that you were trying to write or test or run. Um, because if you happen to use um, a floating point number, or indeed an integer, as a pointer, and update the contents of whatever location it was pointing to, as likely as not, you would update a piece of your own code. And now the effects of updating your own code are obviously that you behave, that the program subsequently, uh, perhaps not immediately, perhaps much later, starts behaving in an entirely um, uh, unpredictable fashion. In order to predict what is going to happen when you, when you um, assign a floating point number to a um, location which is holding an instruction, you certainly have to know the instruction code of the computer, which the purpose, it, I, I believed it was the purpose of the uh, high-level programming language implementation to prevent you from ever having to know that. Well, um, so I took it for granted that um, for every variable or attribute that could take um, a reference as its value, uh, the programmer must declare the type of the um, location of store which that pointer was going to point to. So this is absolutely standard practice in modern languages, even C. Um, sorry, am I right there? C++, anyway. Um, require you, when you're going to use a reference, to say what kind of thing um, it points to. Um, usually a record or object uh, consisting of uh, several uh, variables held consecutively in the store, and you were required to declare the types of all those variables, particularly, of course, if the object itself contained a pointer variable, it was very important to know that it was safe to follow those pointers and treat what they pointed to uh, indirectly as uh, being of the appropriate type, floating point, integer, or pointer. Um, and these, these um, uh, um, uh, additional type information I knew perfectly well, and everybody uh, now knows, can be checked at compile time. Um, in the same way as the types of all the other variables and attributes which were not pointers. Um, it was only actually after many, um, uh, many years later that I discovered that that was in fact quite an original idea. Um, I'd taken a lot of the ideas for record handling, um, object, object orientation from the similar language, and more ideas from um, Doug Ross's uh, programming uh, uh, paradigm or design pattern, uh, which he called Plex. But neither of, neither of those at that time had any method of checking the um, uh, indirect, the, the uh, types of the attributes or variables that were accessed indirectly through the pointers. Um, now the great thing about record handling, I realized, was that if you structured your data as a set of records, you would never, never have a subscript error. There is no need to test whether um, the pointer is within range. You cannot construct a pointer that doesn't point to something that exists and is uh, of the expected type. 
And that's logically impossible. And so uh, here is a whole class of errors that can never happen again. Um, now, it really was quite a good idea to do this checking at compile time um, because there was a, definitely a time penalty in um, uh, doing all the subscript checking that my Algol compiler used to do uh, for our customers. There was a problem with the, with the subscript checking. Um, a little later on, um, uh, we asked our customers whether they would like the option of switching off the type checking after they tested the programs. Because a lot of people thought this was a perfectly reasonable, reasonable thing to do. Um, I, I once said that uh, removing um, type checking from your running programs um, and using them only for testing is like wear, wearing um, a life jacket on, on your practice emergency drills and taking them off as soon as you really had, uh, um, as soon as your ship was really sinking. Um, but when we, when we asked our customers whether they would like the option of taking the life jacket off, they said no. And we never put in a facility an option for switching off the type checking. But still, it was a very uh, serious mistake for my company for a very interesting reason. Um, because um, a lot of the people who weren't our customers, but we, which we wanted to sell our um, computers to, were users of the Fortran language rather than the um, Algol language for which we had a compiler. We didn't have a great, we were a very small computer manufacturer, we didn't have a great deal of programming effort. So we thought that we would provide a Fortran compiler by translating from Fortran to Algol. Um, it's actually uh, rather more difficult than it seems, but it took about a man year. A good programmer produced something which could at least run Fortran programs, but not all of them, but many of them, by translating them into Algol. It was a disaster. No Fortran user would touch it. Do you know why? Somebody guess? It was slow. It was slow. Yes, in theory it was slow, but they had a, they had a more, a more um, um, uh, vital reason. Type checking. Yes, yeah, sort of. Um, the real reason was that they couldn't run any of their programs. Because once, um, uh, once you translate the Fortran program into Algol, within the first few milliseconds of running it, it comes up with a subscript error. Now, um, of course, I, I said, well, that's a good thing, isn't it? Now you know. Correct it. <laughs> no, they said. <laughs> I don't care about the subscript error. I just want it to run <laughs> the same way that it does on a 1790. And so, I mean, quite reasonably, they weren't going to go through all their Fortran programs, which our rivals' computers could run perfectly well, just to remove little mistakes like subscript errors. Um, and they never did. Um, but now things, things have changed a bit. Um, people are a little bit more worried about errors, and they are moving to languages like Java, in which subscript checking is, is standard. So... Um, uh, everything so far seems seems fine. Um, we've got our object orientation with um, careful type checking of all the pointers. So everything is all quite safe, and there's no overhead of testing every subscript for its for its uh, correctness. And then I went and invented a null pointer. And the null pointer, if you use a null pointer, you either have to check every reference, or you risk disaster. Uh, most people, of course, like the Fortran programmers, prefer to risk disaster, indeed to suffer disaster, uh, rather than uh, check all their subscripts. Um, I didn't know that at the time, but my friend Edsger Dijkstra, who was also 
uh, working with, with the team uh, developing an LGOL 6. He thought the null reference was a bad idea. Um, and he, he, he gave a very, very subtle and very abstract reason for it. He said, if you have a null reference, then every bachelor whom you represent in your, in your object structure will seem to be married polygamously, or rather polyandrously, uh, to the same person. Let's call her Nulla. Um, I thought that was a rather <laughs> nice criticism, but that my real criticism is that it um, brings back again uh, unnecessarily all the um, agony of having to choose whether to run your program fast um, without checking or run it slow with checking. Now, I did know that there was a solution to this problem. Um, it was um, uh, based on the idea of uh, discrimination between objects belonging to a disjoint union class. Um, uh, a very, um, an idea which I got from uh, pure mathematics is that of a disjoint union, that is a union between two sets which have no members in co common. So a language can quite reasonably have a um, facility for declaring a new class um, not um, as the Cartesian product of um, attributes uh, drawn from other classes, but rather as a disjoint union of various other classes. For example, um, if you had a class of vehicles, uh, you might classify the vehicles as either uh, buses or private cars and separately declare uh, different structures of attributes for each of those two classes. So a bus might have an attribute which indicated the maximum number of passengers and a private car might have an and um, attribute which um, gave you the uh, capacity of the trunk or the boot, the, 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 the luggage carrying capacity as opposed to the passenger carrying capacity. Um, and every time you accessed either of those components of the object, you would have to do it within a discrimination clause which um, attested um, it looked at a vehicle, uh, with a vehicle, it would say, when it is a bus, you, do, you, um, you can look at its um, uh, number of passengers, and when it is a car, you can look at the um, uh, capacity of the, of the trunk or the boot. Um, but you rapidly see that the size of the program, uh, the source program, gets uh, quite a bit larger um, by having to make all these uh, discrimination clauses. And you're going to have to deal with both cases um, uh, separately. Now, if we insisted on a discrimination clause, then we should make null not into a value of a pointer, but rather into a class a class which uh, never had any objects in it and which only had one pointer which obviously didn't point to any object. So now, whenever you wanted to have a null pointer, um, you would uh, declare your uh, pointer to be either a pointer to the null class or a pointer to, shall we say, the vehicle class or the wife class. Um, and that would give you a way of specifying whether you wanted this pointer to be able to take a null value or not, or whether you wanted um, uh, it to remain um, definitely pointing to something and you would never uh, have to test 
Um, do a few exercises uh, using this particular notation. You see again, it's really quite cumbersome and there are a lot of um, uh, corner cases. What happens if you assign a new value to the pointer uh, which you are currently analysing and assuming to be a member of the bus class? So inside the code which processes the buses, you assign to the pointer itself a pointer to a car. Ooh, oh, language design is a terrible job. You always have to think of these, these corner cases. Well, perhaps we could forbid that. Then there's an even worse uh, problem with initialization. Uh, one of the things you want a high-level language to do for you is to protect you against uninitialized variables. And the standard way of doing that is to assign a fixed known value uh, to every variable or attribute. And null is a very, well, it's really the only uh, certain thing that you can assign um, as a value of an attribute to a recently created pointer or pointer attribute. Um, and so if you want to get around, if you want to um, avoid using null, then you have to invent a whole sort of sub-language to use for initializing pointers that aren't allowed to be null. Um, and this is all right as long as all your objects are in a tree structure, because you can then start with the leaves of the tree and build up in a hierarchical and well-ordered fashion uh, the value of a little tree network um, to be the initial value of your new variable. Um, but if you wanted to create a cyclic structure this way, there's no way of doing it. You, 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 in no normal programming, you would assign a null value to the pointer and later on you would um, insert uh, the cyclic pointer um, uh, perhaps to somewhere else in the tree. Um, anyway, all those problems in the end I didn't want to deal with and that led me to um, suggest that the null pointer was a possible value of every reference variable and a possible mistake on every, every use of that reference variable. Um, uh, uh, and perhaps it was um, a billion dollar mistake. Well, the world is gradually recovering from the mistake, I'm glad to say. And uh, modern languages uh, like C Sharp or Spec Sharp, um, and I think even Java, are introducing the idea of uh, reference declarations which are declared to be non-null and reference parameters which are declared to be non-null and compile time checking which um, checks that, that such variables do not have, uh, could not possibly have uh, null values. And they, they have had to tackle um, all the problems of, of initialization um, and discrimination um, uh, in a context which is now very much more con uh, very much more complicated than I'd ever thought of all the, con the context of of, of um, uh, overloading and um, uh, inheritance uh, makes the uh, concept of initialization uh, very much more elaborate than um, I would ever have dreamt of, but uh, that is what is happening. I think the um, uh, movement must have been motivated by the fact that, that, that null references were an expensive mistake. Um, and expensive, the, the figure of a billion dollars um, is, no, I, th I think we ought to put, uh, put things in, in, in reasonable uh, proportion. But perhaps I ought to say I did feel I ought to take responsibility for this mistake. Uh, but I thought perhaps since it was unlikely that I'd ever be able to pay back a billion dollars, I would keep rather quiet about it. So don't tell anybody, please. Um, yes, um, 
I put forward the view, which really derived from my very first experience of making, um, uh, making, my, making the Algol implementation um, proof against octal dumps. It was octal, octal dumps in those days, not, not hexadecimal. Um, <clears throat> that a programming language designer should be responsible for the mistakes that are made by the programmers using the language. So, and that means that programming language design is really rather a serious engineering activity, uh, not one that you should give to, uh, shall we say, programmers with nine months' experience of machine code programming, but one which requires a good scientific basis, a good understanding, a great deal of ingenuity and invention, a lot of control of detail, and um, uh, a clear objective that the programs that are pro uh, written by people using that language would be correct, would be proof against at least certain kinds of errors, and perhaps as easy as possible um, to get, get right. Anyway, not, not full of little traps and um, syntactic awkwardnesses that, that uh, people are constantly b bumping their toes against. Um, it, uh, th this was the view that, that led me to the idea of using proof, uh, using a formal verification of programs um, as uh, logical, logical and mathematical models um, is a method of conducting research into the design of good programming languages. I wasn't too optimistic in uh, 1969 about the likelihood that uh, people out there would actually be using proofs uh, to guarantee the correctness of their programs, uh, at least not in the immediate future. Um, in fact, not for the next 30 years was my prediction. Um, but that by investigating the logical properties of your programming language and uh, finding out how difficult it would be to prove correctness if you wanted to, you would get an objective measurement of how easy the language was, was to use uh, um, correctly. So if the proof of program correctness requires a very large number of uh, different proof rules, and if each proof rule has a lot of side conditions, in particular, if the validity of the local application of a rule to a small bit of program depends on properties which can only be established by a scan of the program as a whole, then you know that you've done a bad job as a language designer and you do not have to get your customers to tell you that. Um, mind you, they don't because you, it's actually very easy to persuade the customers of your language that everything that goes wrong is their fault and not yours. But I rejected that. I thought, no, language design is a serious scientific engineering activity and uh, we should begin to take responsibility for the mistakes that our users make um, in the use of our languages. That's beginning to happen again. The Java, Java programming language um, and its successors have all used um, uh, avoidance of error as one of the criteria that uh, they use uh, in the detailed design of new features of the language. And I have to give them, I'm delighted to give them, a, a great deal of credit for that. Of course, it is only one of the criteria, and it's not, or at least it wasn't, at the time, the most important criterion. The most important criterion, of course, was compatibility with everything that has gone before. You can't throw away so many of the millions or billions, millions, millions of lines of code um, that have been written in other languages. So... Um, one has to, well, as in engin every engineering and every commercial product, uh, product, you have to make concessions to uh, 
the commercial um, and historical reality. Um, you cannot uh, pursue an ideal uh, to its limit. But gradually, um, ideas change. Um, programmers get more interested in um, uh, correctness and demonstrable correctness and uh, production techniques and languages and checkers, uh, anal anal analytical tools, um, test case generators and so on, um, that are going to help them uh, to get their programmers programs um, correct. Um, the analogy that I draw is with um, um, agricultural pollution um, and with um, vehicle safety. Uh, when Ralph Nader first started publishing uh, his uh, articles and books on unsafe at any speed, what he was saying had no connection with the marketplace. The customers were just not asking for um, reliability or safety as one of the properties of their vehicles. But gradually, over 20, 30 years, um, customer feeling about unreliable vehicles uh, has changed um, with the aid of um, lawmaking. Uh, the, there are legal constraints now which require basic standards of safety to be built into every vehicle sold. And so there is a possibility, a possibility at least, um, that the marketplace and the commercial necessity will um, move in the direction of um, greater reliability of programs and of the languages in which they're expressed. Um, you know what's driving this? Um, a move towards more ideal programming languages? It's, it's not idealism, you know. Um, although I think for many professional engineers, engineers in the sense that I described in my opening lecture, they do have ideals and, and they do pursue them in preference to not pursuing them whenever the opportunity arises. No, the real commercial imperative uh, which requires greater um, attention paid to formal correctness of the programs, it's the virus. See, the virus, uh, or the malware, the worm, or whatever it is you call it, that enters your computer and does dreadful things to it, it reaches parts of your program that normal execution never reaches. So it's no longer um, uh, adequate to test your program against all the cases that are likely to arise. Because even if you succeed in, te in testing all against all the cases that are likely to arise, the virus will find the case that is not likely to arise. So um, it forces you to get the whole program correct not just the parts that are going to be used by your customers. You've got to get the parts that, we use, that will be used by viruses correct, too. And that can't be done by testing. It has to be done by analysis. By analysis of the source code, using type-checking techniques, obviously, they are the simplest, but increasingly more and more sophisticated reasoning techniques are being applied to high volume code uh, to check that um, it doesn't uh, contain any um, of naughty things like, like null reference de um, dereferencing. Uh, well, if I'm responsible for a billion dollar mistake, um, I think my reason for bringing it up is only to put even more blame elsewhere. Um, the designers of C, <laughs> well, one can definitely quantify because the buffer overflow is a direct result of the get, for get routine in C which does not check the subscript bounds of the string uh, 
that it um, is asked to uh, input. That allowed the early viruses to get in by overwriting the return pointers in the code. And these early, very simple viruses taught the world how to write malware. Without this very simple entry point, it is quite possible that nobody would ever have thought to look for the more subtle things which are now being exploited every day uh, by people who are now motivated and skilled and whose profession it is and indeed whose income it is uh, to write uh, botware, um, another uh, form of malware. Um, so if it hadn't been for the get routine of C, we might have had no malware. Now one virus, uh, code red virus, um, some years ago now, I'm glad to say, was estimated of, to have cost the, the world economy $4 billion because it really brought down all the networks in the world. And the interruption to business, ordinary banking and, and um, uh, other businesses was estimated at that amount. And there was another one at a similar um, level. Um, uh, that, I think, is quite a lot more than the Millennium Bug, um, which was successfully averted at a cost a bit less than $4 billion, perhaps. So, right, that's my case. Um, any questions? Oh, yes, sorry. Uh, you shortly mentioned uh, spec sharp. What do you think about singularity and spec sharp? I think they're both very strongly motivated by the same kind of ideals of, of uh, making it easier to write correct programs. Um, and they are um, they're, they're research prototypes, of course. Um, and they are therefore constructed to be um, more flexible and, um, than anything that is actually transferred into a production, a pr a production uh, compiler. But the ideas that they've uh, researched in, in Singularity and are continuing to research in Spec Sharp um, are being considered as uh, possible extensions to C Sharp and indeed to other languages. The, uh, there is, I think it's released internally in Microsoft, a, a contracts package which allows a programmer to write assertions uh, preconditions, postconditions, and invariants in code of all the visual basic languages. Uh, so it's common to, common to uh, uh, C sharp, C, C++, visual basic. I don't think Microsoft does a COBOL, but it's... Uh, um, so we'll see. It's, uh, it's not terribly elegant. I mean, it's a bit of a ad hoc paste on, but... Um, at least it uses the ideas. And it uses the ideas in test um, as well as in proof. So we can see, um, uh, give assistance at both, at both ends of the scale, both in, both in um, detecting errors by assertions as early as possible. Uh, they're beginning to be used in uh, tools like PEX, which do test case generation because you try to generate tests that are going to violate the assertions, or at least they're going to satisfy the preconditions and violate the postconditions. Um, and um, uh, then there are sort of more advanced tools which attempt to prove the correctness of the assertions um, at compile time. So do you think that the null reference was inevitable? If you hadn't invented it, don't you think that someone else would have done it? As, uh, especially since all of those reasons for not doing the right thing, so to speak, would yes. still have applied for many years from that point on? Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's, of course, um, the, uh, a, common, um, I mean, a common excuse to, to, to say if I hadn't done it, somebody else would have. Uh, so I, I don't like making it myself, but I don't mind you making that. <laughs> yes, I, I think perhaps uh, one could, might say the null reference was there uh, all the time, just waiting to be invented. <laughs>
Yes. Uh, so how do you feel about then the C sharp um, allowing nullable types uh, in later versions of the language? Well, this is, uh, I mean, if you're going to have types that are not nullable, then you've got to have types that are nullable too. But C sharp is like, like Java. It will indeed do a runtime check um, if it can't detect that um, a reference is not null. So it's safe, at least. It's, it may not be very efficient. And of course, runtime checks are one of the nastiest things to stub your toe against. They're better than not having runtime checks, but they're still rather uncomfortable, both for the programmer and for the eventual user. Yes? How do you think about the um, race of the untyped languages, or dynamically typed languages, should I say, Ruby? Well, um, I think that programming is now and always has been such an extremely varied activity that you choose the right tool for the job um, and you live with whatever the consequences are. Um, I, I don't have any personal experience of how these untyped languages are used. Um, but I have heard that people who are using an F-sharp-like language as um, a scripting language, um, F-sharp has a lot, lot of type inference, so you don't actually have to write things, um, are pleasantly surprised and pleased um, at the um, uh, easy way that it is not to make a mistake. Um, Java was originally a runtime typed language. Um, so it, it, it seems that any language designer in the laboratory um, tends to do the easy thing and write, write an interpreted language uh, in which additional checking is uh, almost unnoticeable in the overhead of interpretation. And then of course, it becomes, uh, if it gets popular, it becomes a compiled language. And we get back into the same old treadmill. Mm. Um. I would be delighted if the two panelists would like to. I'd like to take a vote again after the, the talk. Would you be prepared to? Persuade people to vote that uh, null references are a good idea. That would be great. Um, yeah, you had are this we... example of Nala, the, the wife of the student. And all the wives are called Nala because they all had a null reference. Um, the thing is, if you have something like add children in that case, you have to check that the student has a wife. So uh, even if you don't have a null pointer, later in the context you have to check for it. So if you have technically not another reference, <coughs> sorry, you still have to che check for it later. So you delay the check if you don't allow a null pointer. Yes, thank you. Anything more? You're, you've got to persuade these people that null references are a good idea. Uh, I didn't say it's a good idea, but... Um, the, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, the, the thing is you have to handle with the, the actual case, either if you use a technical null pointer or yes. not. You have to check later on, is it a technical null pointer or, or is it a pointer to a null class type? Yes. You just delay the check. And in terms of thinking to fail fast, the null pointer allows you definitely to fail fast. Which, of course, I mean, a null pointer is a bad thing to happen, but it will, it will happen, either if you have the null pointer or the pointer to the null type. I think that's, that's a very good, very good point. And, and um, I, th I think, as a language designer, I would say that the language design that the best thing you can really hope for is not to create any new problems. 
problems of programming are difficult enough already for the very reason that you suggest. There are just so many cases, and each case can be tested here or there or, or elsewhere. And no matter what um, lovely notations or concepts or checks you put in your language, you can't get away from the fact that there are many more cases that, that the program has to think of and deal with all those cases. It doesn't really make programming easy. It just removes one of the difficulties. I, would, I, I have two things to say against this, uh, uh, your argument here. And the, the first one is a very high level one. I think that if you have a situation where you have a field that is pointing to your wife, and that could be I don't know, or another person, then you need to take a step back and do some domain modeling. Because that's probably not a correct, I mean, that, that's a view of the universe that it's probably convenient for a programmer, but it's probably not as convenient when you need to extend the program and maintain the program and so on. So that's the high level one. The low level one is that there are better techniques than doing a, I mean, the null object pattern you're talking about is actually almost as bad as nulls in themselves. Yes, nulls in Java cause runtime exceptions, but they don't actually cause real hard failure. But those runtime exceptions are still runtime exceptions that you need to handle. And they can ha have happen anytime you have an object reference. So if you instead actually have to call out those places where you have either a null reference or a, I mean, you, you already made the case about these joint types. The Haskell community are using, uh, and Scala community are using the maybe monad, which is basically a type that's got two subtypes, one non subtype and one uh, some subtype where the sum subtype includes the actual value and the none is equivalent of none, uh, the actual null value. And what happens is that if you actually type check this, you'll see that you call out this maybe place when you have it. And all other cases, you will not have a null reference. So you can actually verify these things statically. You will never get a runtime exception in Haskell if you don't use the IO monad, for example can forget to check actually if there is a wife. Yeah, but the problem is that if you don't if you if you don't call it out explicitly but you actually have to do the other thing. If if you do like in Java you have to explicitly say okay this is non null. Then you have to check all the other references. But in this case it's actually only the places where you can have a null reference that you need to check, which actually cuts down a lot of the repetitious code. Okay, I agree on that. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. I get there is a problem about generalization because also we got this kind of thing when we tell everything is an object. And there goes the problem too because everything is not an object. Where for example in, in C sharp I have I need to have two string and the other method that get hash code and all of that comes with an object, even if my thing is not an object. Yes. So I guess it, it with the abstraction, everything has null and everything is an object and everything, everything. I guess this kind of generalization is is, is a problem. I think that's, uh, that's a good point. Um, the criticism I have of pointers is that they are the, the um, uh, data structuring equivalent of a jump in the code. Um, and they are probably, I mean, they've got to be there. They're doing a very useful job. But the trouble is that, that, that you can't see by looking at it what, what job they're doing. In uh, machine code, a jump is used, we know, for uh, constructing loops, for constructing uh, conditionals, and for dealing with exceptions, jumping out of, out of uh, um, a method body. Um, they're used uh, for constructing coroutines and various other sophisticated control patterns in your program. Um, the thing that the programming language designer tries to do is to incorporate the different uses of a jump into a special notation and structure in which the purpose of the jump is made explicit and in which the, I would say, the proof rules which you apply to the code are simple and well-structured um, and um, uh, may be one day even useful. Um, now, for a pointer, I think I agree with you. Perhaps the vast majority of uses of pointer are to implement 
what has been called an ind India rubber memory. The problem with real computer memory is that you can't take it apart and insert something a bit larger um, uh, just because you need it now. So, you know, if you could, this would be very nice because we'd never have any overflows again. When the numbers got too large, the computer would just shrug a little bit and create a little space and you'd have a double length instead of a single length. Can't happen, unfortunately, so we need a pointer. A pointer that points to something which is logically belongs entirely in line as part of the um, a part of the store that is pointing to it, but which, f for hardware reasons, can't be held contiguously in the memory. Um, and if this conjecture is correct, this means that nearly all pointer chains are maximum length one. Uh, when you've got a longer chain, you've got the possibility that it, uh, it is a, a chain that follows the branches of a tree. So that um, uh, effectively it's just a recursive application of the India rubber principle. You could do the whole thing textually by bracketing because uh, text has got the, the uh, India rubber property that we can take it apart and insert a bit in the middle. Um, but in the store, we use pointers for this purpose, and so we construct a tree. But trees aren't enough for everything, so we need other kinds of pointer in the tree. Some of those pointers are going to be convergence pointers, which point to a different branch, but which preserve acyclicity. And some of them are going to be cyclic pointers, that point back in the tree to some earlier place in the tree. And for each of these paradigms, you might introduce a different notation and different checking conventions, different proving conventions for uh, verifying your program. The, um, the difficulty of pointers in general, as you, as you indeed have mentioned, is that they are used for all these purposes, but that the languages don't recognize the different structuring uh, principles uh, that are um, being uh, Im implemented uh, by each particular use of a pointer. They do it very, nowadays very well for control structures, but for data structures, anything goes. So, if I may, um, since I have been thinking about how I could possibly defend the null pointer um, after your speech, I would like to draw on one of your esteemed colleagues, uh, Simon Peyton Jones. Maybe you have all seen this picture uh, that he likes to draw to defend his own historically bad ideas. Um, <laughs> where on one axis you have uh, unsafe, no, useful. <laughs> unsafe, safe, and here by extension use use less. He would point, put C up here, useful but unsafe. And at least at the time Haskell was invented, he put it back in here. Because it was a cute language that had no side effects. And of course a program without side effects is completely useless. And then he would draw Nirvana here, and basically say that everyone is trying to get here, 
Haskell by trying to invent ways of making it useful by, in a disciplined way, um, supporting side effects. Whereas from this camp, we're trying to invent formalisms and ways to avoid uh, stupid things done by the, um, by the programmer. And, um, and in the best of worlds, and this kind of draws back to your keynote, where you have sort of the scientists here who don't really... It doesn't concern them much if they create something that is useless, as long as it is actually ideologically sound. Uh, whereas the engineer up here doesn't really care about the sort of the, the elegance of the thing as long as it's useful. But um, when we started in 96 to develop a product in Ireland, we had a pretty good idea of how we wanted to write it. Problem was, at the time, if we had done it in the good way, it would have been useless because we would have been nowhere near the performance requirements that we had. Nowadays, we can write it in a way that we would have liked to write it back then, 13 years ago. But back then, it was not an alternative. And we had to think of ways that we could now describe as a historically bad idea. Because doing it now is really, really stupid. Because now you can do something better. So that was my defense. Um, <laughs> I'll accept that defense. <laughs> yes. I need that defense. <laughs> You're just telling me that way back then I was an engineer producing something. I did read your Turing Award speech, and uh, yes, I would agree. <laughs> Thank you. Are we done? Excellent. Thank you all very much.